Republic, Benigno Simeon Aquino III. Thank you. Good day. Please sit down. His Excellency Jorge Domecq, Secretary Marojas, Secretary Laila Delima, Secretary Armin, Brother Armin Luisro, Secretary Bochabad, Secretary Edwin Lizarda, Sani Coloma, Rene Almendras, Manny Mamba, Meli Nicolas, Chairman Francis Tolentino, Chairman Cesar Villanueva, Chairman Francisco Duque, Chairperson Grace Polito Tan, Chairperson Eta Rosales, Commissioner Kimenares, Governor Sai Tetanko, Mr. Batara Sian Turi, Mr. Jay Collins, fellow workers of government, honored guests, Mahamina Magkumakamabayan, good morning to each and everyone. When I accepted the mandate of the people back in 2010, I did so without the expectation that I would just get on a merry go round and wait the rest of the term out, perpetuating the status quo and perhaps even exacerbating existing problems. Rather, I did so with the resolve to effect transformational change and fulfill the promise I made in my campaign, which said, Kung wala korap, walang mahirap. And translated, where there is no corruption, there will be no poverty. Of course, I also entered office knowing that there would be many challenges along the way. Allow me to give you an example which would best serve our discussion for today. Early on in our administration, there was a need to procure rifles for our police service. Some of you may know that there are many different rifle systems in the world. We decided that an M4 assault rifle would best fit the needs of our personnel. And we then went through the normal bidding and procurement processes to seek potential suppliers. For some reason, what looked like the winning bidder turned out to be supplying a completely different rifle system on a platform that used completely different mechanisms and technologies. But was dressed up to look like an M4. In this situation, what we wanted to get and what we were about to get were two very different things. On top of that, we were going to procure this at a price much higher than the normal M4s. What really caught my attention was that this particular supplier was already on the post-qualification stage of a process that was supposed to have taken several phases. If their rifles had passed these evaluations, we would have been obligated to procure items that we did not need or want in the first place. Fortunately, they failed to pass the post-evaluation or post-qualification stage, and I received this information in time and was able to call the attention of the people involved and direct our leadership to conduct the necessary investigations and to stop this unnecessary procurement. One can argue that all the necessary steps were followed religiously. However, when you are almost obligated to accept the delivery of an item you never wanted to order, there is something inherently wrong in the situation. And even though we were ultimately able to get the right ri rifles at reasonable prices, this anecdote shows us an unpleasant aspect of governance, that sometimes even if all the processes are followed, the end result still would not necessarily redound to the benefit of our people. Perhaps that is one facet. Faulty processes that might have made it easier for things to fall through the cracks. Another facet is that certain people who had to make decisions did not have the necessary data, which would have allowed them to know from the start that these particular rifles should not have been pre-qualified much less post-qualified. This presents a picture of the challenges our administration continues to confront today. Many of these are rooted in systems and processes that while they may have served their purpose at one time, are badly outdated. Even worse, they are susceptible to abuse, which could lead to inefficiency, wastage, and opportunities for the unscrupulous to steal from the nation's coffers. This is why we have taken every step necessary to ensure that under our administration, the national budget is crafted for the benefit of our people. One innovation we introduced in the 2014 budget cycle was that of the General Appropriations Act, or GAA, as release document system. The GAA is the law that contains the budget. In the past, special allotment release orders, the very famous SAROS, or notices of cash allotments were needed before agencies could begin utilizing their budgets. 
Some unscrupulous individuals saw this as an avenue to line their pockets. They would delay the issuance of these documents, asking for incentives or in plain language, bribes, in exchange for the release of documents. With the GAA as a release document system in place, the law that contains the budget is the release document itself. This effectively solidifies our legislators' power over the first, a mandate that by law is theirs in the first place. In effect, with the dawn of the first day of 2014, around 86% of the budget was released to agencies, lessening opportunities for corruption and giving these agencies the ability to begin implementing their projects right away. Greater efficiency, integrity, and true service. These are the principles behind the reforms we have made in our budgeting process. But we know that we cannot look at the big picture alone. There is also a need to examine the details and ensure that each agency can make best use of the funds allotted to them. This is not merely about agencies adhering strictly to the proper bidding and procurement processes. In some cases, it requires them to modify processes to become more efficient. Our Department of Public Works and Highways, or DPWH, is a remarkable example. The old process, or one of their old processes, involved potential bidders for infrastructure projects writing letters of intent. Their names would then be posted in a list. This facilitated collusion among bidders who would know who their compet competitors would be. They would then speak to each other and agree to synchronize bids, defeating the purpose of the public bidding process. DPWH Secretary Babe Singson no longer requires these publications of lists in the bidding process, facilitating true competition which has led to the Filipino people getting the infrastructure they need, the right projects at the right quality at reduced cost completed within a reduced time frame, all because we put the right people on the job. As a matter of fact, to date, the DPWH has saved not less than 19 billion pesos. I hope these examples have made it clear. All these processes and systems, all of these laws are there to serve the people. The people are not here to be at the mercy of processes, especially when these processes have already become obsolete and counterproductive. After all, government exists precisely to improve the lot of the people they swore to serve and from whom they receive their mandate. And so we continue to ask ourselves, these questions. How do we further plug leaks in the system to prevent graft and corruption? How do we make our processes that much more efficient? Our goal is to institutionalize reforms that make it very difficult for unscrupulous individuals to steal from the people, regardless of who sits in office. This is where the introduction of cashless transactions comes in. A recent study identified that one of the major financial risks remaining is the high volume of cash advances in agencies. The risks of this, system, of this kind of system are obvious. The presence of large sums of cash in offices can pose a temptation to even the most honest employee, not to mention those who would willingly take advantage of such a situation. We are far from being a cashless society. 98% of all retail financial transactions in our country are still made in cash. The government seems to be ahead of the market, with 54% of its financial transactions already done through a cashless system. And for the sake of accountability and efficiency, we are pushing the envelope further. It is only appropriate that we celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Procurement Reform Act by introducing a mechanism that modernizes government procurement the launch of the Cashless Purchase Card, or CPC, program. Cashless Purchase Cards will be issued to agencies for low-value payments of a restricted number and type of goods and services. They will resemble ordinary credit cards, but will have additional restrictions more suited to the needs of government. Through the Cashless Purchase Cards and other similar reforms, government financial transactions should be 100% checkless and 80% cashless before the end of this year. The first phase of the CPC program will take place in the first quarter of 2014 with the Department of Budget Management and the Department of National Defense and the General Headquarters of the Armed Forces of the Philippines as pilot agencies for implementation. A limited number of cards will be distributed to these agencies with allowable purchases, likewise limited to medical supplies, meals, the transportation of official documents, airline tickets, 
and construction supplies for minor repairs. If all goes well, the program will be rolled out and cashless purchases cards will be distributed, excuse me, distributed in other national government agencies next year. Even in this initial implementation, the CPC system will already help improve the overall fiscal management of government and will help the thousands of officials who must deal with the needs of their agencies every day. In the future, a government director in a far-flung province need not go through lengthy processes if money is needed for minor construction to repair their office. The cashless purchase cards will allow them to procure the necessary materials and immediately and given that accounting for transactions is automatically done, suspicious use of the card can be tracked easily. On top of that, this system also allows us to capture and collate the correct data which redounds to real benefits. For one, a bigger sample size of data will allow us to refine our understanding of programs that need funding. It will also make it easier for the Treasury to determine how much cash is needed on a daily basis, giving us an accurate record which government can use in future decision making. Data such as those gathered through the cashless purchase card serves as the lifeblood of another program we will be launching in the summit. We will be unveiling a platform that will collate all relevant government data, not only for use in governance, but also for the information and use of the wider public. Open Data Philippines, which is accessible through www.data.gov.ph beginning tomorrow. Open Data Philippines is a website for publicly available up-to-date national data from the total enrollment in public secondary schools over a certain period of time to the aforementioned budget and procurement data and everything in between. As the project progresses, we can only expect the wealth and depth of data available online to grow with information on anything and everything we can think of. None of us should make the mistake of thinking that Open Data Philippines stops at being a repository of data. Its very name says otherwise. Opening data is about making statistics understandable through the use of reader-friendly visualizations. The more technologically savvy among our countrymen can also make use of available data to participate and create their own visualizations and applications for the use of others. Among those already included in the website are applications that can help Metro Manila residents plan their daily commutes. Other applications seek to make government expenditures more accessible. Ultimately, opening data is more than just making columns and rows of figures available for viewing. It is about empowering the people through information. This is also something our government can make use of. As president, I once thought that I would have access to all kinds of information anytime, every time, and all the time. To a degree, that is true. But it is, not simply, it is not as simple as punching a few keys on a keyboard. Sometimes it actually involves wading through documents that are fragile given their age. And that only happens, of course, if you can find out immediately where these documents are located. Open data is a step towards having all information at our fingertips which we can use to better assess improve and even develop programs and policies. The cashless purchase card program and Open Data Philippines are only the latest in a long list of reforms we have implemented towards instituting good governance. Everything else, including some of our plans for the future, can be found in the brochures that were included in your kits. I encourage you to read and familiarize yourself with them. Not only will they give you information that you can use over the next few days, they will also show you how strongly we are committed to living out the principles of integrity, accountability, and transparency. They will also show you that our administration is not in the business of building castles in the air. Earlier, when I spoke of upgrading systems and processes, I did not mean this only in a technological sense. We are upgrading in the truest sense of the word, exploring every possible avenue to improve the way we serve our countrymen. Sometimes it has been as simple as staying the course and making sure that existing programs fulfill their mandates, such as truly chasing after tax evaders, smugglers, and the corrupt, to hold them accountable for their actions. Other times, they were groundbreaking in the sense that our administration pursued modernization on an unprecedented scale, for example, in the projects we have launched today. 
What ties all these initiatives together is the efficiency and the persistence with which we have pursued them. Our determination to let Filipinos truly reap the tangible benefits of good governance. Moving forward, this will continue to, to characterize our efforts. This will allow us to reach greater heights and move from success to success as we make good governance the norm, a firm foundation that succeeding administrations can hopefully build on for the benefit of the Philippines. Thank you, and may you have a successful summit. Thank you, Mr. President.